Hey, everybody. You know, we are back again this week. I want you to grab your coffee. It's time for Living with Favor, where we talk about faith, abundance, vitality, overflow, and relationships. I'm Lisa Mosby, your host of Living with Favor. Thank you much. Thank you so much for being here and letting me offer a little bit of advice. Hey, you know, today's special guest um, is here to talk with me about meeting our authentic self. You know, we hear the words authenticity all the time, but what the heck does that mean, being authentic? You know, they weren't authentic. We're going to explore a little bit more about that with Eli Jetson, Elijah Jetson, I'm sorry, Elijah Jetson from Real Life Style, where he coaches his clients to be free of the social conditioning that we've been born into. Living in alignment with our organic nature, many folks don't truly know themselves. It's common to lose ourselves in the world around us. Is your spirit dying to shine? Are you living a caged life? Maybe you're living on autopilot. Elijah coaches his clients to realign and redesign their real life. Welcome, Elijah. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, we were, um, there's always the meeting after the meeting or the conversation before we get started. And sometimes I feel like I should just flip the record button on as soon as my guests show up because we have the best conversation. So I'm going to try to pull questions from our conversation beforehand. But first, what I want to start with is maybe you could share with us a moment that you realized, or maybe the moment that you realized that social conditioning was a barrier to living authentically. And how did that shape your mission? for uh, real lifestyle? Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. um, what comes to mind is more of a reflective awareness. Um, I had the gift of growing up in a small town in Long Island called Montauk, New York. If you ever look it up, it is a very small town, but it is one of the top 10 beaches often in people's, in like the states and the countries um, because of who's there and how beautiful the location is. But right. in this small town, <laughs> My grandfather from the West Indies found himself located as a Caribbean man in a predominantly affluent, interestingly affluent environment. And he was a chef at the time. So I got to grow up in that dichotomy or that awareness of being not financially wealthy, but emotionally, actually where we started the conversation, spiritually, emotionally, like my cup was full. My family loved me. I was always appreciated. I felt it in the community. I was loved, thriving, had no concept of wealth, of what that meant, what money meant. But then as I got older, I realized everyone around me was very well off financially, <laughs> very well off financially. Um, and that was, that's where the awareness has started to really come up because I left Montauk and moved to New York City. And then I had the juxtaposition to have the observation, to actually start using that to develop my own perspective of the world yeah. because I was able to really see that difference and see how people were using these things differently and how that existed as a kid too in a different way was when I was younger, I stopped celebrating holidays at a very young age because I didn't, I realized it didn't make sense to have a day for something that was like Mother's Day. I was like, why do I need a day when my mom is here every day? I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. And I started asking questions. No one had answers. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to stop playing that game. And this was before nine. I was like, I'm not playing that game with you guys. Thanksgiving, all of it. I was like, I'm not eating. I'll eat tomorrow. I don't, I don't want to acknowledge this. Um, and I think that's where the questioning began. Wow, that's beautiful. I am a horrible gift gilder, gift gil giver, because I it's, it's I didn't know that subconsciously. I'm having a, a wow moment. Um, yeah, because I I give gifts when it inspires me, not on a certain day. And so I I've always perceived myself as a really bad gift giver because I don't <laughs> I don't plan advance. I don't I just I feel. Um, the constraint and the strain of getting the perfect gift. And then how often do people return what you give them? And um, the, the sentiment of that gift goes out the window. So that, that was my takeaway from where you went with that, yeah. but there's so much more to unpack with that. Yeah. The, the culture that we live in um, you know, it's all about sales and marketing and how we get sucked into certain things and where do we get lost in that? You know, the concept of a caged life is powerful because mm. we don't even see 
the cage around us, right? It's it's yes. all of these unspoken rules of Mother's Day and Christmas and, um, you know, ways that we're supposed to show up, things that we're supposed to do, uh, get married right out of high school or right out of college. Back in the day, it was high school. Now it's get ready yeah, married yeah. Right out of college, have 2.4 babies and, you know, all yeah. of these rules. So it can feel like a cage and we get lost in that. So what does it mean cage life when you're using that term? I, I have, I, I shared kind of my vision of it. Um, yeah. How does, how does this affect one's spirit and their potential yes thank you for that question and the framing of that because there's we're gonna have to go a little educational piece <laughs> there's levels of consciousness right mm -hmm. so there's to me consciousness by me consciousness through me consciousness as me consciousness and then if you think of these in terms of energetic frequencies the lower is the lower self right the lower levels of consciousness is to me which is victim right the world's happening to me i have no awareness of what's happening right i'm only at the effect not the cause of my reality right and then we transition to buy me consciousness which is more the entrepreneurial mindset of i am a go-getter i'm gonna make it happen i'm assuming responsibility i'm running down the street it's mine it's mine it's mine the me 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 right and this yeah. is as you think of a child it's the same thing i can't i can't take care of myself right? Then I can take care of everything. It's my toy. It's my thing, right? And then through me consciousness is normally a dance. And I had a beautiful analogy presented to me. This is the mirror. And how we play with the mirror is interesting, right? Because as kids grow up, now they're using this mirror because the world's reflecting to them their value, their this, right? They're having that internal conversation. Then as me is at higher level, when you become mature, and I love it's when I look at it as like when people get a certain age, they just don't care anymore. Like this just is 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 what it is. I'm gonna curse. I'm gonna move like this. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna behave how I want to behave True. because I just understand this is my reality. Like I, I've seen it, right? As they say, either poop or get off the pot, right? Like that's how you get right because you're you've you've realized right. You did the introspection, or life has ex you have the experience to say, wait, this is my reality, right? So when we look at cage life, I did that because where does the cage exist? At what level? Do you have the cage? Because we're always cycling through these frequencies, these levels of ourselves, these levels of understanding. And we can use business as an example. Where's the bottleneck in sales, marketing, finance? Right? Where's the bottleneck in that aspect of the business, but also in your life? Where's the, at, where's the bottleneck? Is it in your intimate relationship? Is it in your health relationship? Is it in your energetic relationship? Do you randomly get angry and get frustrated when things happen? Do you cry when things happen? Or when someone ask you a personal question, whether it be your child or your significant other, do you respond in a way that is very conscious to them, but unconscious to you, right? And then business, the same thing. Are you having a bottleneck in the business? Is it because there are these cages, right? What did you, I use the reference of my family as the best example, because there's a story you had as a child of what money meant, what love meant, what happiness meant. And if you never question it, that's where the cage starts to develop unconsciously because now you use this as perspectives and ways of belief. And so when we say the cage and how I see it with most people, I normally observe it with them as the words they choose when they describe themselves or what success means to them. Because they'll either add a limitation or they'll add a belief that they have and subconsciously, they don't know that that's the belief. So they'll say it like, oh, but only if, or when, and if only, and they'll say these little things. And then that's where you see their cage or their, their, and I'll say the cage, because cage is like the limitations, right? Where their limitation meets them. But then you'll see where they, and then it's areas. Again, this is why I did the analogy, because it's areas. Some areas, there is no cage. And you're like, hey, we need to reel you back in. And then other areas, there's too many cages. So that's my perspective on that. <laughs> yeah. I think of the caged mind, you know, because yeah. when, when you talk about the words, um, conscious language, I've studied a little bit about conscious language, love speaking about it, because yeah. we don't realize the words that we use. And I was in kindergarten probably when definitely elementary school. I don't know how young my dad had, uh, had exposed me to Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And I don't know if you know who that, who that book, but it was, it, it was one of the greatest selling books of all time. 
and it's about a seagull and how they have to stay at the shoreline because that's where the food is. And Jonathan would just go and go as far as he could, as fast as he could. And everyone thought he was, you know, there was something wrong. He was broken because he didn't follow along with the gang. And what my dad wanted me to know was that anything and everything is possible. You get to decide. Don't let the world, world tell you about that. That's, to me, a cage mind is when you start to create limits and belief systems, exactly what you were saying of what you can and can't do. And that oftentimes comes from, you know, teachers, peers, parents, uh, friends saying, oh, you don't want to do that. You might get hurt. And then also that reptilian part of our brain that says yes. we have to stay safe and protected. And, you know, we can't venture out. We can't explore. We can't, um, you know, be free to live our life on no one's terms but our own, you know, to an extent. I mean, there's laws that we need to follow, sort of, at least in most places. But um the idea that uh, that the cage might even start in the mind, you know, and the belief systems that we have is uh, it's brilliant. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. You know, autopilot living was another one that uh, that I saw you had in some of your uh, in some of your social media places. Autopilot living, common issue. You know, we, we were chatting beforehand. It's like, do you plan for the next day? Do you pick out what you're going to wear? Do you set your wins, your intentions? What is it that you want tomorrow to look like? Or do you just kind of get up and go through the drudgery and, you know, put on the uniform and 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 live on autopilot, eat the same breakfast every day, don't expand and try new things? What are the top strategies for helping clients to become more present and engaged in their own lives? Yeah. Thank you for that again, because this is an important framing of, and this is a dance. This is, this one's really a dance because it's, in business and in life, same thing, don't separate them. It's the system, right? The goal is, can you surrender to your systems? Oftentimes we don't set up a system, so we default to whatever got us there. And this is where most small business people, most solopreneurs, most individuals around the world get stuck, is you're just doing what got you here versus what do I act, what do I actually want to be doing, right? What are the reflective questions? What's the process? So the first thing is get a coach, get a mentor, get a book, get a schedule, get something outside of yourself where you're asking the questions you're not asking yourself. You framed a really good question at the beginning of just shifting from like, why can't I go to sleep to why am I up, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have something in your life that's imposing upon you a different standard or a different perspective. And that's normally where we get into unconscious patterns because the gift is when you consciously live consciously, the unconscious patterns are consciously decided. So if I'm someone who fasts and I like nature, I can consciously do what I did now, come to a different location and be present with all the things I know to be true in my life where I don't have to think about this. What's the quality of the water, right? What's in the fridge? What are the people going to be like when I wake up? Is there animals? Is there cars running down the streets? Is there going to be a tractor trailer coming at four in the morning? Is there lights outside? Can I see the sky, right? Because I consciously decided, but I set up that system so I don't have to think about it. So it's really the review process and picking small areas or larger areas to really get conscious on where these things are moving and values, right? There's a whole other thing we'll go down around values, but it's literally the simple thing of the autopilot, it's assigning the destination. That's when autopilot becomes, in fact, it's the destination. You, once you have your destination, then you turn on autopilot. Most people are turning on autopilot without deciding the destination, but they are, and this is where time is important, and we said it again, is I think the biggest shift, if I answer this very specifically, is shift the time horizon in which you make decisions. Many people are thinking present moment and they're just responding to their reptilian brain, right? The amygdala, the RAS, they're, they're, they're just their body. They're not responding to their highest levels of consciousness. They're responding literally just to their fleshly needs. Like I need to use the bathroom. I'm hungry. This is uncomfortable. They're not thinking, processing, why is this uncomfortable? Why do I feel this way? Why am I not breathing into deeper into my body? right? Why am I not? They're not asking those questions based on levels of awareness. Though so I think shifting timeframes in which we make decisions 
is where that autopilot is important because you change the destination. If my destination is I just need to use the bathroom right now, that's very short-sighted. And it, it may be great, but you're going to need to use the bathroom. But then if you thought a little longer, you could say, oh, am I hungry? Do I need to get anything from the kitchen? Do I need to do like there's a series of things you can add to that because maybe that trip you can do four things, not just one. While I'm up. <laughs> what do I do while I'm up? Um, yeah, the the picture that I got as soon as you said that was kids in the house. You know, they make a mess. And then yes. it's like, okay, how do you put away that? You're going to your bedroom to go to sleep. Why don't you just grab your stuff, your dirty socks or your toys or whatever's laying there? You know, you're going anyway, and it needs to get there. Why do I have to do that for you? Can't you just, you know, <laughs> like, then everybody's working on that same, that same schedule of like tidying up. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's what, that's what kind of came to mind when you were saying that. Um, I think autopilot, when, when I think of autopilot, mm -hmm. I think it takes away from us, our intentionality, like, you know, coming back around to the title of the show, authentic, your authentic self. If we're living on autopilot, how far away are we from mm. authentically who we are? We haven't determined what it is that we desire or want. And what, what that takes me back to is I was with my husband for 29 years. And then when I was single again by myself, mm. I didn't know if I really liked cruises. That's what we always did because it was best for him to be able to get out of the office away from the phone. Mm -hmm. We never turned on TV, Electronic went, electronics went away. But I didn't know if I really loved that. I knew that that's what was best for him. So I had to go on a cruise. And I, I found myself doing things to make sure that those were things that were that I like to do or just things that we did together or they were things that were best suited for him and I went along with it. And I'm sure the nice. reverse was true for him as well. You know, when you're with somebody nice. that long, you kind of start to lose yourself within your relationships. Mm -hmm. And I, I want you to kind of address that. You know, there's a point where I want to be in a healthy relationship, but I don't want to lose myself in that relationship. Now that might be with your significant other, with your children, when your identity becomes completely, I'm the mom and I'm the dad, all of a yes. sudden we have empty nest syndrome because I've lost myself in doing that role, but it wasn't necessarily who I am. And I wasn't filling up and feeding my soul, my spirit. So not really a question here, but I would love it if you would kind of speak um, to that idea. Yes. Um, and, and this is, again, I, I say this a lot to most people is if what you're doing at work doesn't translate home, you need to change what you're doing because for centuries, eons, it's always been one thing, right? What you were doing in the work always made its way home in some way, shape, or form, and vice versa, right? The quality of your relationship, and it does, whether you're conscious of it or not, it is reflecting back and forth, right? Um, and when we look at the relationships, I'll use time, but I'll also use energy, is how, and this is a, a spiritual question they normally ask, like, if this was, if you had to do this every day for the rest of your life, would it be something you want to be doing? And these are the things I think are important, right? And, the, and this, this is our zones of genius, right? This is our gift. This is our purpose. How you find your purpose. And then it becomes your destiny and your thing when you realize, how do I lean into that? And I, I within that relationship, for me, it was values and beliefs, I think was the, the big piece when I looked at relationships. There goes the balloons. <laughs> new uh, new uh, technology. Um Values and beliefs, I believe, is the piece I pay attention to most, most when it comes to relationships, because that's the North Star. Yeah. If our values and beliefs, the thing can be, the things can change. If our values and beliefs are in alignment and we're using those and we're changing, and this is where the autopilot destination adjusts because it's like the wind in the sail. It's like our values and beliefs mature over time and frequency. We need to speak weekly, monthly, quarterly, the same way the business does it. You need, you should have some type of, these things should translate into relationship, right? Family dinner. I do a call on Sundays called family dinner because I want to remind people, it's like, hey, you must check, you should be checking in with your family. This is a reminder to have that at least weekly, let alone quarterly or monthly, that check-in with these values, with what's important, with what's because it's changing. And if you're not checking in, you're getting into autopilot and you're not changing the destination because there may be a detour, there may be this, but some people, their autopilot never turns off. So they're in relationship, but they're never checking. Where are we going? Are we still in the same destination? Did it change for you? Back to what you said with your husband, did it change for you? And you didn't tell me that we're going down a different street. 
And now I'm stuck in the car with you because I'm the passenger, I'm not the driver. So I think that for me, it's these little pieces of intentionally, right? This is my intention comes from the setting up the foundational piece. Where's my intention at the inception point? And then how do I prioritize that review as frequently or as intentionally as possible? So we're constantly walking down the same street. We're constantly, we're consistently, constancy of purpose is something Dr. Deming speaks about, where it's like, it's the most important thing. Are we cons- Are we making sure we're all looking at the same outcome? We're all looking in the same direction because when we start looking, even if it's a little bit, Tony Rod speaks on that too. It's like, if you're hitting a golf club and it's off just a little bit, just a little bit, that over time <laughs> really goes somewhere else. So for me, and relationship is that. It is that dance. It is the uncomfortable. It is the beauty, but it's saying, are we decided in the same thing that we're doing this dance together? Yeah. The, an air, what uh, flashed in my mind is an airplane is off course 98% of the time or something like that. Yes. 90 plus percent of the time. It's constantly yes. course correcting. Even when it's on autopilot, it makes yes. adjustment for wind and weather and, and you know all of the factors that go into that. And so our life is the same. Life is always happening around us and we're constantly course correcting, but we need that review process to keep our eye on the destination, whatever that is, you know, that, yes. that predetermines destination. If we don't keep our eye on that, we can end up in a completely different place. If we just take off and the plane takes off with no direction, they're never it, very, very unlikely that it's going to land on where its intended spot was if they didn't plug it in and, and, and set a course yes. for it. Yes. Earl Nightingale says something around that in terms of boats. He's like, if you let the ship go without a destination, it's going to end up on a beach deserted and derelict. <laughs> and yeah. that was a wise thing to think. It's like, if there is no goal, how do we get there? Yeah. So defining goals, coming up with systems and strategies and putting them into place. Uh, yes. We've been working within a community, the Morning Rush, and anybody yes. who's watching here is more than welcome to join us. Um, it's a free uh, morning empowerment call for busy executives Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern time. So it's called the Morning Rush. Uh, reach out if you'd like. Uh, me to plug you into that and get you the zoom link in fact i'll I'll put it right in the notes since we brought it up today um, but in addition to that community elijah we're working on a couple of other communities and you've even talked to me about developing a community for uh, herbalists and yes. for people to pursue um we'll call them alternative health but um to me they're traditional health you know like they're yes. the ancient ways the grandma's remedies the folk remedies um you know it, it's not accessible to every everybody and i call that health you know, sovereignty or food freedom, yes. uh, when you know how to harvest what grows naturally in the world, you're never without food. And we could probably get rid of a lot of the um, issues around starvation and hunger in this world if we taught people what's available to you around you, you know, grab the pine needles and get your vitamin C by making a cup of tea or um, go harvest those wild plums. So creating that community where people can get answers, they can ask questions, how do I find help for what's going on in my health and my yes. wellness? or communities around business. So a lot of the folks that watch this are predominantly women, um, yes. you know, but and and entrepreneurs and getting them the help that they need to be successful so that we don't have the failure rates that we have with entrepreneurs. People have the desire, they have the passion, they are willing to invest the time, energy and effort, but sometimes they need people to come alongside them. And so creating a community for them where they can get that assistance. You know, can you talk uh, to the importance of being in community and building our own communities? Why is that such a um, a passion of yours? Yes, <sighs> because I'm so happy you said that because it is the universal law of autopilot. When you're able the health, the quality of a relationship, a true, the true, one of the true qualities of a relationship is your ability to pretty much relinquish responsibility of an aspect of yourself and really feel that you could do that. And that's what a community was. You mentioned this about your experience where like you were able to find a community where you don't have to think, right? And this is conscious autopilot because you were thinking, you were aware of all the things you would do. And you allowed someone the space to attempt to fill in that space. And you felt comfortable to say like, okay, they're doing this a quality job. I know what's good and I know what's bad. And they seem to be performing at a good rate for me to turn my brain off a little bit and relax and surrender. 
And the reason community is so important for me is because once I say this with, I say this to say this, I, I prefer working with the top 3% of any industry, anything. I always look at like, what's the numbers? What's the metrics? How are they living? What's the existence? Because there's always a, that's always the percentage of people ready to make a decision. If you're talking to any market, there's about 3% that will actually make a decision now. Mm -hmm. The other rest, there's marketing, there's follow-up, there's a whole bunch of things you have to help them, but there's a small margin of people that are ready to make decisions. And those that make decisions are the ones I love working with because they normally influence the others who don't make the decisions, but they're willing to do the uncomfortable work that comes with that. And I'm saying that because me and you have had, have had a similar last nine months of being responsible for more than God gave us the capacity to be responsible for a lot of things at the same time, family, nature, ourselves, other people's bills, their bills, and this, this, that, you know, like a, a lot. And some people that's not, that's not their uh, path in life. They would respond to those situations differently. And that's not a bad thing. And this is a thing I think we're having a big conversation. We're kind of centralizing the conversation publicly in the marketing of like individualism, be an entrepreneur, go do this. That's not some people's destinies. That's not the best place to put that person. So my fight for the community is when someone says, hey, and shows themselves and others, I can take the responsibility of life. It can beat me up. It can throw me down. And I know that there's something greater that I'm here for. And I can stand up with a smile on my face and it can be, I can make it look easy, but that doesn't make mean it is, is the people I'm like, you need to go build a community because what you just did as a testimony to yourself and your relationship with something higher than this physical plane needs to be the example for others because they have the questions, they have the blind spots and they need you. They need you to pioneer forward in a society, in a world like this to be the example of what it's like to one, make it look easy, but to get the answers because it's things we're speaking about, especially with health, especially people are not, not doing it because they don't want to. There's no one in that space that gives them access to that information or that access that's that space of themselves. We're speaking of authenticity. And this is why the community is so important because when we are the lighthouse, as you reference one of our conversations, when we are the lighthouse that's done the work and built ourselves to this tower because we we got pushed down the stairs so many times, not because we're different. No, no, we just got pushed down the stairs a lot more than most in the areas that you're looking at. And we didn't give up. Mm -hmm. We kept pushing. We kept going. And that's where I'm in, pushing very intentionally to make sure there is leadership happening in those capacities. And there is that stewardship of community because you need, and this is a big thing around, I call it, we call it the, the cannibal giants of what we look at these businesses and these things because they're so in they're so absent of what's actually happening naturally in the world that they are blind and they are eating themselves and they are building like because most most billion dollar companies are not built in a sustainable way to even allow their business to grow sustainably because they're just disconnected. But we say this when we look at them is just that subtle, that subtle, 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 subtle awareness that if they had community, if they did feel safe, if they did feel the things we feel, they would approach the world differently. They would. So it's important that we have beautiful souls like yourself and the people that we get to see and lead stepping up as leaders, stepping up as conversations, because that's the only thing that's missing right now is who is the leader. So for me, it's important. And again, I say it again, too. I'm vertical. I'm not wide. I like to go very deep. It's not about a billion kajillion people. It's about a hundred of the right people. That's all I think about. If you can get every person who has power, influence, went through the, became the lighthouse, they have a hundred of the right people around them. The world's a better place. I'm in a town, in a community right now. Where there's less than 200 people in this circumference at the moment. And I'm like, if you had all these people on the same accord and there was someone saying, I am the leader. And the intention and purity of what everyone's actual intention is to compost, to have gardens, to support each other, that changes the world. 
And in, in reality, not in essence, in theory of marketing scales, like there's 150 people that you can actually take care of. If you actually got, especially specifically in this moment, I'm going to say this because I'm glad we're having a public conversation, especially you, Lisa, like especially you, because there's so much wisdom you have across so many areas that people really, and this is what communities used to be, they need to ask you the question like, hey, what do I pick from the garden today? Hmm. Versus going to the grocery store and doing the autopilot, the marketing. Who was the loudest voice in my head? Was it Colgate? Was it Johnson & Johnson? You know? No, it's <laughs> go <mine>. outside, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing for me when it comes to community. Hmm. I love that idea. Um, going deep, not wide. Finding those 100 people that you resonate with and building that community up. You know, for someone feeling trapped by societal expectations, you know, what, um, where would they start? Where do they start making changes? You know, what initial steps would you suggest for folks who are listening to this and they're, they're, you know, nodding their head? Yes. They're physically, yes. Leaning, you're leaning in <laughs> and going, wait a minute, I want more of this. We're going to end here shortly. And yeah. I, I don't want to end here. You know, what would you suggest for folks? to take those in, in next steps. Yeah. Well, the salesman and marketing in me is going to say, click one of the links down below so you can get closer to both of our communities and what we're suggesting. So you're taking that next step actionably. Um, but if you're there by yourself, I would grab a notebook and I would write down two lists. I would make a list of all your problems, all the things you think are problems and things that you have to do, like the difficult things, just make a, exhaust the list, everything. I need to talk to this person, something that happened 10 years ago, I wish I said, sorry, make a, exhaust a list of all of that, get that out, and then do the same thing around all the change you want to see in the world. All the positive things, all the things you think should be changed in the world. And what you're going to do is become a master of alignment and CEO and decision making. And now you're going to pick the top five most important on both of those lists. And you are going to take action to bring those to completion. Because the biggest, the hardest thing is getting started. You're already here. You've watched this. You've seen this. Clicking that button, you've got started. The hardest part for most people is the first 30 seconds. It's not the task. It's they put it off for so long. Oh, I need to open my phone. I need to do this. I have to go through this. I just don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. I just don't want to do it. But once they start, they see how easy it is. So if you get those two big things out of your way, that's going to start the momentum. And then if you're in communities like ours, it will continue the momentum and get the ball rolling. Beautiful. We are at time. It goes so fast always. Um, get the ball rolling. How are you all going to get the ball rolling today and ask better questions? You know, are there some things that you've been asking yourself that are almost like a woodpecker pecking in, in into the, the tree or the side of the house? You know, that question you just keeps irritating you. Switch it around. Change the way that you're asking that question rather than saying, you know, we talked about this before the show started today. Um, why am I up at three o'clock in the morning? I can't sleep. I'm really struggling with sleep. Flip that question around. You know, what can I do with this time when I'm awake? Is there a productivity activity, a productive activity that I can take at this time when I'm awake? Um, obviously, my system needs me to be awake. What can I do with this space and this time and this quietness? There's always a better question to ask. So if you're struggling, if you are um, feeling caged and you want to get out of that cage, get into community, a community that is in alignment with what it is that you're looking for in your life. Let people come alongside you and help you. We're here to do that for you. Elijah, how do people get in touch with you? Where would they find you? At the moment, there's a, well, there's two places. Um, if you are finding yourself and still discovering who you are and you're looking for a place to start that journey, I would go to reallifestyle.com. That is a bit more of the previously casual side of myself. If you're more in the transitional space and really looking to start, start this reality of yours, 
um, we will have something at realwealth.com or I will be doubling down on LinkedIn. So you will see my face there. You will see more content happening on LinkedIn um, around real wealth, real wealth strategies and my name. And yes, those would be the two places at the moment. Beautiful. And of course, we'll have those in the notes. But for those of you that are listening, I wanted you to just have that information so that you can go check that out right away. Sir, it's been a pleasure and honor. And I, you know, I want you to come back because I love our conversations and we just need to record them wherever we are, because I know people will glean so much. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you. My pleasure. It's an honor and a pleasure. Yeah. If, uh, if folks, if you could use a bit of advice to start or expand your business using social media, let's discuss your business today. Simply go to lisamosby.com and that's lisa M O S B E Y.com and click book time with me. We'll uh, take 30 minutes to learn more about your business, how we can support you and how we can get you connected into the community that's ideal for you. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope to see you live on the next Living with Favor. Come on back, folks. <music>